Welcome to our December meeting. Thank you for giving up your Saturday, two, two Saturdays before Christmas. I think that's very generous of you to, to give us your time, all of you, actually. So um, today's meeting is about testing, testing of young children in primary schools. And welcome, Jill. Thank you for joining us to talk to us about this um, today. I don't know whether people have seen the extensive press around this. There was, there was some brilliant press in September about the testing of um, four-year-olds in primary schools with four-year-olds delivering a petition to um, number 10 Downing Street. And for me, actually, the best part of that was after the girls had had handed it over and they turned around and they looked at the, the press and then they took this massive jump off the step. And I thought that just illustrated perfectly just how young these children are when they're being tested formally in schools. So anyway, welcome Jill and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to, if you just give me two seconds, I've just got, I've got a presentation. I just need to get it um, set up. Just take me a second. Can you all see that? It might take a little, just a little minute to uh, come into focus because it's an MP4 file. Um, she says like she knows what the technology is. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much, Anya, and thank you all very much indeed for having me along today. Um, as, as Anya said, my name is Jill Robinson and I'm part of the uh, More Than A Score campaign. Uh, we really appreciate the chance to come along today because we're always keen to spread any, any opportunities that we have to spread the word about our campaign. So for those of you who don't know us, um, More Than A Score is a campaign with the aim of changing the way primary children are assessed and the way that primary schools are measured. More Than A Score is a coalition with tens of thousands of supporters. The NEU is a very, very valuable supporter of ours, um, but we also have parents, teachers, head teachers, academics, educationalists, and we also have support from, as well as the NEU, the other two main teaching unions. And in fact, we now have cross-party support in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So let's take a look at the way that schools, the primary assessment system works today. Um, primary school children in England face more government tests than in almost any other country in the world. As I'm sure you all know, uh, SATs and other tests were cancelled last year and this year. Um, but this term, as schools faced probably the biggest challenge in a generation in recovering from the effects of the pandemic and lockdown, like lockdown, the government chose to bring them back. Not only that, but they've actually increased the number of government tests in primary schools. In fact, they have doubled the number of statutory assessments compared to before lockdown. There are now government tests in five out of seven primary years, plus an extra test for the year twos. Uh, it's happening right now, and it's the autumn phonics screening check. Uh, this is because that particular test was cancelled in summer, along with all the other tests. Um, and it means because if you don't pass that test at the age of seven, you have to resit it for this particular year group, that means that they will be resitting it when they take their key stage one sats in the summer. And that means that for some children, they will actually face three sets of government tests before their seventh birthday. And that's for a year group that's actually never completed a full year in school without disruption. Let's have a look at some of these tests in just a little bit more detail. Um, as I've obviously mentioned SATs in year six and year two and the phonics check, those are the government tests which were in place and statutory before the pandemic. But this year there are two new tests. The first is the so-called reception baseline assessment, which actually Anya just mentioned a minute ago. Uh, Four-year-olds have been tested in English and maths before half term, before the October half term. So that was within the first six weeks of starting school. And in seven years time, the data that that's being collected from that test will be compared to the results of year six SATs to measure academic progress. This is the third time the government's tried to introduce baseline and it continues to be roundly condemned 
not least because it's virtually impossible to ever get a straight answer from a four-year-old, but also because the government has provided, provided absolutely no information about how it plans to compare the results of a 20 minute test taken at the age of four with four days of tests taken under exam conditions at the age of 11. Let's have a look at some, what some four year olds have got to say about it. I know what you're thinking. Four year olds these days when they start school are spending too much time settling in, making friends and getting to know school routines. <laughs> Instead of instilling a love of learning, consider giving them this, a baseline test. That's when you're meant to play the music. Are we doing our baseline formally tests four and five-year-old children in English and maths within the first six weeks of starting school. Brilliant! The teacher will take individual children out of the classroom to give them a test. I want to stay with my friends. Shh. I like school. Shush. Shush. I know what you're thinking. This will take time. Yes. Three days in the first weeks of reception. I don't like that. What I like is a chance to gather data in a big way. And we all know what reliable and consistent data four and five year olds can provide. QRX, DB. I'm Spider Man. We don't even need to tell the parents the results. In fact, the tests don't actually help the children at all. We want to go to a play. <laughs> They're designed to measure schools, not support children. I don't want to take a test. Let's sing on the counting song. And so, come on, let's all get behind baseline tests for four-year-olds. Actually, I'm. I can't do this. I'm. I'm, I'm sorry. This. this is, oh. <laughs> So a, a real insight into the world of four-year-olds, as anybody who's got any experience of them will, will testify. Um, the second new test that's being introduced this, in, this prime, in this school year is the multiplication tables check for eight and nine-year-olds in year four. These children will take a test online where they will be given 25 questions to answer with only six seconds per question. If they get an answer wrong, hesitate for too long or type the wrong number, they will be failed. They'll be failed because the reported pass rate for this test will be 100%. Uh, I won't ask you to do it now, but in your leisure time later on today, you might want to try the times table check for yourself. Uh, you can find it quite easily on our website. And believe me, if you think six seconds is plenty of time to answer, uh, you will be proved wrong. <laughs> And finally, the final test, obviously, is the mother of them all, which is the is key stage two TAT, SATs, probably the most high profile and controversial of all assessments. So is the primary system currently failing our children? Well, the obvious answer is yes, but let me explain why. Firstly, the entire basis of our current system is misguided and unfair. The government wants to measure school performance and create league tables with the results. To do this, they have decided that children's academic performance can only be judged via standardized tests. So the burden of an entire school's performance rests on the shoulders of the children. They must sit the tests under GCSE style exam conditions in the case of year six SATs, and it's impossible for them not to feel the pressure placed on them. This obviously causes stress and anxiety. We've heard terrible stories of children not sleeping for weeks before taking their SATs, tipping over their desks and walking out, crying, giving up halfway through because they feel like they're a failure. Placing this pressure on children through standardized tests inevitably has effects on the curriculum. It's very difficult for teachers to avoid teaching to the test when they know that their job could depend on the results or their school could be forced to become an academy as, as has happened more recently. So for months, 
maths and English are prioritised to the detriment of other subjects. Children don't have the chance to enjoy a rich and broad curriculum, missing out on not just history and geography, but also art, music and drama. Some of the most extreme examples of the effects on the curriculum can be seen in the much derided SPAG tests. This part of the curriculum has been, not been designed for the benefit of pupils to help expand their imaginations and instill a love of reading and writing, but entirely so they can be tested. This is why children have to learn about fronted adverbials and diagraphs and subordinate clauses, all the things that children and we adults never had to think about until Michael Gove came along with his reforms a few years ago. Finally, and most cruelly of all, the current primary assessment system fails our children because it literally fails our children. Every year, one third of pupils head to secondary school having been told that they do not reach the expected standard. That's a harsh thing to be told at the age of 11. We know that disproportionate numbers of children living in poverty and those from BAME backgrounds fall into this so-called forgotten third. Rather than improving standards, the current system increases inequalities and makes life harder for pupils who, need, who most need support. In our campaign, we sometimes have come across a series of myths around primary assessment. So let me very quickly bust some of those myths for you today. Politicians say, and they've said this to us many times, parents want SATs and they want other tests and they want league tables so they know how well a school is performing. Well, that's simply not true. We've done plenty of research on this, most recently in the spring, when only 15% of parents told us that they wanted SATs to actually return in this school year. SATs and league tables come bottom of the list when you ask parents how they want school performance to be measured. Happiness, well-being of pupils and a broad curriculum quite rightly come top. It's also a myth to say that if you're against SATs, you're against testing in any form. Informal tests carried out by teachers are a really useful way to measure academic progress. Teachers and heads agree with that. Tests stop being useful when they affect the curriculum and put children under unnecessary pressure. There are also other ways to judge a school's effectiveness, and I'll tell you about one of these in more detail shortly. Politicians also say that um, it's the fault of teach, it's the school's fault if children are feeling under pressure when they're taking SATs. Well, five and six year olds being told that they failed a phonics test and they'll have to sit it again. Eight and nine year olds doing a time pressured times tables test where one slip means that you fail. 10 and 11 year olds sitting four days of SATs under exam conditions. A third of those 10 and 11 year olds then being told that they've not met the expected standard before they start secondary. Can that really all be the fault of teachers? And especially when these are all because of tests set by the government, not by schools and not by teachers. And finally, something that has come up more recently is the question of how will we know what's been lost in education terms during COVID without SATs? We mustn't fall for this line. SATs and other tests are not designed to diagnose gaps in learning. They're designed to measure academic progress and attainment, falsely, in some might argue. Teachers have been doing a fantastic job this term, assessing where learning gaps are and work incredibly hard to bridge them in a way that suits individual children. Post-pandemic, most importantly, of course, schools need money, but they also need time. Instead, they've been forced back into a rigorous statutory assessment system which robs everyone in the school of the time that they need. So what does more than a score do as a campaign? Well, a number of different things. Uh, we raise awareness of the issues with the system and we provide an ongoing critique of it. We conduct regular research to make sure our arguments are always evidence-based and up-to-date. Uh, we're a single issue campaign and single issues can cross party lines. So we work hard to bring together a variety of stakeholders to support our work. And we also show that there's an alternative to the current system. So let me give you an example of some of the work that we've been doing. He, this was actually mentioned earlier on, um, but here's a very good example of the work that we've done to, in, to oppose the introduction of the new baseline test. Our petition against the test got over 112,000 signatures. And this is what happened when we, we and our 
real stars of the day, uh, Amina and Rowan took it to um, Downing Street. We have got to give our teachers the freedom to teach and give our children the freedom to learn. I'm joining with more than a score today to call on the government to scrap the reception baseline assessment. It makes absolutely no sense to me why they're testing four-year-olds in English and maths when they've only just started school. Four-year-olds are children. They should be playing, they shouldn't be being tested. It's the wrong thing to do, we shouldn't be doing it. Well done to more than a score for this campaign. last thing I want is for her to be sat down for 20 minutes to do a test which has no basis and which has no benefit, it's not going to benefit the parents, the teachers, all the children. of Downing Street, we've handed in our petition and it's time to say scrap baseline tests for four-year-olds. Yes, you do really see how young they actually are when you see, when you watch that, I have to say. <laughs> um, the second thing that we do is uh, we conduct research. We, we've commissioned many pieces of research with parents, children, teachers and heads. There's just a few examples here. Our parents' research showed how they really feel about SATs. We produced a very extensive report in uh, the spring demonstrating why there was no place for SATs in the so-called recovery program. And that report included new research plus contributions from heads, education experts, children, MPs, union leaders. And most recently, we conducted a survey among teachers who were actually carrying out the new baseline tests and reception. And as you can see here, the responses prove that the test is simply a waste of teaching time. It's disruptive and it tells teachers nothing they don't already, already know. Uh, the third thing that we do is bring stakeholders together around a single issue. I, oops, sorry, gone too far there. And I mentioned that. And then the, the final thing is what is the alternative? Um, an important part of our work is proving that there is an alternative to the current system. SATs have been around for such a long time that it's hard sometimes for people to think there could be another way. Year six teachers supporting their pupils through SATs actually took them themselves. More Than a Score is not just about abolishing SATs. We think schools should still be held accountable and we think low pressure assessments can play an important role in children's academic progress. In the summer, the British Educational Research Association, BIRA, published a rigorous, credible alternative. I won't go into all the technical details here. You can find the report online and I'll, I'll put a link up for that in the chat as well. But the key elements are replacing statutory tests for all pupils with a national sample, which will thereby remove teaching to the test and the burden being carried by pupils a national bank of assessment materials for children to take under low pressure conditions so that parents can be reassured that their child is on track. Surveys will supplement that, those uh, tests and assessments um, among parents and teachers and pupils, all of which will give much richer data which schools will then use to create their own improvement plans. There would be a new body to oversee the sample and accountability will not be based on league tables, but on whole school performance. And Ofsted's role will change to focus on school improvement and the system as a whole, not just continuous grading of schools. So that's a little bit of a whistle stop tour through more than a score and what we do. Um, obviously, I'm here with an agenda, which is how can you help us? <laughs> Um, and simply the, 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 simple most, the simplest way to help us is to sign up, to support and to join our campaign. The more people who speak out, the better. We've got a petition running now and also a Write to Your MP campaign. And I'll share both those links for you when I'm finished. Uh, secondly, work together. Speak to your colleagues, your friends, family, governors in your school, head teachers, counsellors. People like you who can speak passionately about the issues are really, really valuable to us. 
what you're going to find in the next few months is a lot more focus again on secondary assessment. And that's because of what's happened over the last couple of years with GCSEs and A-levels. There's a number of different commissions working now, and they're all going to be reporting, I think, before the Easter holidays. And most of them, we believe, will be coming out talking about reforming GCSEs. And as part of that, there will be a lot of talk about the so-called forgotten third. But the forgotten third is baked into the system from primary. If we don't change the primary system, then we will really be failing our children. Thank you very much. That's great, Joel. Thank you for that comprehensive backdrop to More Than a Schools campaigning. Um, and it's about the forgotten third that I just wanted to quickly ask you just before um, we move to, to Louise. Mm -hmm. um, so if we know that at age 11, a third of children moving to secondary school are not at secondary school standard, we know that those children won't be able to access the secondary curriculum, which means that they fall behind before they've even started. But the government is collecting all this information. So we know, and the government knows from age four, from age five, which children are not going to succeed. What measures are they putting in place to ensure that those children, and they've already captured the data, can succeed? How can that, or, or I, I guess they're not using that information. <laughs> so how, how can they use that information? Because what I would want to see, if we already know that black and minority and ethnic communities, if we already know that children who are living in deprivation are going to form the majority of that third, what I would want to see are measures put in place to ensure that there are breakfast clubs, that families have enough money to feed their children, that those children have uniform, that those children have school dinners, that those children are able to access extracurricular activities so that they have a rounded school experience. Um, but what is the answer, Jill? Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not in government, so um, I can't make that happen. But that is the question. And it really it really demonstrates the fallacy that's behind the current system, because the data is not used to um, to pinpoint those sorts of details. It's not used to access where funding should be should be prioritized. It's not used to support those children. It's used to grade schools and create league tables with the, um, the false narrative that that then provides some form of choice for parents. Parents don't choose schools based on SATS results or league tables. We've seen this in multiple pieces of research that we've done. And um, so the data is, is used purely for political and ideological purposes. It's as simple as that. And in fact, the BIRA report, which um, is very academic and is, is very um, dense in the sense that it's, it's very academic, actually pinpoints another way of using that data. That is the, that's some of the main arguments that they make, which is that if you can pinpoint some of the external factors that are potentially affecting how children are doing in school, then you can then, you can then push the money towards those in a way that's actually going to help those children. The, the truth is that the, the data is there and the data is not being used in the way that it should be used. Thank you, Jill. So I'd like to move to Louise now. Louise Regan, welcome and thank you for joining us. Louise, you're a national officer with the National well, Education uh, Union for Chair, membership Chair, and equality. Chair, I had my hand up. Chair. All right. Sorry, can I, I, I'm going to introduce the speakers, they're going to speak, and then I'll open the room to questions after that. Sorry, Ian, but I will come to you first. Okay, so you're a National Education Union Officer for Membership and Equality. You're a teacher, you're a trade unionist, you're an internationalist, and you're um, on the National Executive for the Socialist Education Association, and you edit the um, publication Education Politics, which is available on the SEA website. But welcome, Louise, and over to you. Thank you. Hi, thanks Anya and thanks to Jill for that very comprehensive introduction. So I mean, some of the things that I would have talked about Jill has covered. Um, 
just so people are aware that are here, I am a national officer, but I, I am a class-based teacher. So I'm currently full-time teacher. I teach year four. Uh, so my class will potentially uh, take or will take the times table test that Jill has just referred to. And I, I would urge all of you uh, to go on to the More Than A Score website and try and do that times table test because um, it is not easy. And as Jill said, the pass mark for children is 100%. If they don't get 100%, they will be classed as failures. And I am really fed up with children in our primary schools being called failures. So do go on and have a look at it. Anyway, I just want to talk a bit about, I mean, Jill's covered sort of the academic stuff behind it, but I want to talk about what it's like being a teacher in a primary school, really. And I've taught in primary schools for 30 years. So I started teaching just before SATs were introduced. I had one year of teaching without SATs, and that's probably one of the best years ever I would imagine. But no, 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 I just, I love teaching. But I have seen over those years the massive impact that primary assessment has had on our schools, on our children and on our families. And I think what I will start with is, Jill is absolutely right, that these are not about, none of these tests are about helping children. None of these tests are about improving education. All of these tests are about high stakes accountability for schools and education settings. And that's really important that we hold on to that and that we keep saying that. I mean, I think when I, when I think about it, I, I find it really hard for children because they're now coming into a school where they're assessed as soon as they walk in the door. I can't imagine what it must be like for four year olds. When I first started teaching, there was no talk of baseline. So uh, nurseries and uh, reception were just places of joy. Uh, you know, I really felt for those reception teachers this year because what you want to do as a reception teacher, and I have taught reception, is to spend that time developing those positive relationships, making sure your children are happy and settled. You know, some children cry for a long time when they first come to school because they are quite intimidated by it. So if you don't have the opportunity to do that, that has, you know, I don't think people realise the long term impact that has for children in terms of their emotional well-being. Emotional well-being is the biggest priority for me, because if children are not emotionally stable and that comes back to the poverty issue as well, then they won't learn because their mind is taken up with things that are stressing them and they don't learn as well. So it is really important. Jill talked about. The, the, the amount of tests. She talks about the year one phonics test. Again, you should all go on and have a look at the phonics test. It's the biggest uh, piece of nonsense I've ever seen, really. Children have to read phonetically. They have to read made up words, what are called nonsense words, because apparently if they read real words, maybe they might cheat. I don't know. Perhaps they might, somebody might be helping them to, because it's a real word, so they can do it phonetically. So they have to have these nonsense words, which lots of children find ridiculous. They don't understand it. And just to make sure children know it's a nonsense word, that they have a picture of a little monster next to it, so they know it's not a real word. Um, and obviously you have to do lots of practicing of these stupid tests because otherwise children are quite intimidated by them. So they do that. The new reading framework is quite disgraceful in that it implies that the only way children learn to read is phonetically. Well, I didn't learn to read phonetically, actually. I learned whole word, uh, uh, real books, and I'm an excellent reader. So, you know, there's no evidence that the only way to learn to read is phonetically. They then have the year two SATs, year four times table test, the year six SATs test, and the SPAG test, which Jill has referred to, again, is an, I have uh, taught SPAG in, uh, in primary schools for many years now. SPAG came about because of Gove, because he thought it would be really important for our children to, have to know grammar really well. The things they have to learn are ridiculous, past, past present perfect tense. I don't know how many people in the room can identify that in a, in a book, you know, and uh, fronted adverbials, embedded clauses, all of these things. They never do it again after they leave primary school. It's not taught at all in the secondary curriculum. So they, it, they're taught it right up till they have a stupid test at the end of year six, and then that's it, it's gone, because they never, theoretically, they were going to develop a secondary curriculum, but it was never taught. When I talk to my daughters about it, they just think it's ridiculous. They say, I don't even know what one is. They weren't taught it at primary, and they weren't, certainly weren't taught, taught it at secondary. It doesn't make you a good writer, and it certainly doesn't make you a good reader. What makes you a good writer and reader is exposure to high quality texts, high quality experiences, good speaking and listening experiences, those sorts of things. 
But I just wanted to say, because I don't want to talk for too long, because I do want to hear from Amy, and I would like to, I really would like to hear your views. Um, but, you know, we have these set tests, but what people and what people may not realise is that because they're so high stakes, what happens is children are tested in every year group all of the time because people are so frightened that they're not going to get the outcomes at the end of year six or they're not going to get good enough results in the phonics test. So children just are tested terminally in every year group, you know, and they are a sort of model of those SATs tests that they get all of the time. So it becomes this sort of negative spiral for children in terms of their experience is that life is about testing in primary school rather than life is about enjoying learning and be becoming a, a good, you know, developing those good social skills. And I suppose the final thing I'll say is this, we, you know, people have talked about narrowing the curriculum and for sure it definitely, there's no doubts to me that this regime has completely narrowed our curriculum. But also what happens is, even those children that are that are that need additional support to meet the test standard are those children that then get taken out at the very times that you might be doing something that is not English or maths because most primary schools now teach English and maths all morning and in the afternoon is when you may do other things and that's when often those children get taken out and aren't then able to access that broader curriculum so their whole curriculum becomes focused around things that they find quite tricky and that is a very depressing state for them and this government said this is about standards it's not about standards the only I think the only league table internationally that we're doing well on at the moment is the one about the most unhappy children where we score very highly because our children are very unhappy in schools unfortunately and that's something we have to sort out so you know my union completely supports more than a score uh, we do very good joint work with them. We will continue to do that uh, and uh, I will continue to do that. Very, very final thing is, it has been referred to that I do publications. We have just, we have a couple of books that we, we're doing a series of books called Reimagining Education. Uh, the first one was sort of a broader book uh, uh, with a sort of wider scope around the whole of the education system. But the second book, uh, this one, Reimagining Education, is purely focused on curriculum and assessment. And I have three boxes of them. So if anybody uh, in your area would like us to post you some, I'm more than happy to send those out. If somebody sends me an address, Anya, I can send them to you directly to distribute up there. Um, but please do read it. It's got some really good contributions and we'll give you a broader picture. Thank you. Wow, that's great, Louise. Thank you. Um, Amy, welcome. And, and young Kirkpatrick as well, welcome to you too. It's great to see you there. Um, so Amy, you're Joint Newcastle District Secretary for um, NEU, but you're here today in your very important role as being a teacher, but your more important role still as being a parent. So Amy, tell us, what are the, the, what are the impacts of continual testing for you as a, as a parent? Um, well, I'm the mum of three boys um they are spread out in age so i've got a 14 year old um a nine year old and this is baby charlie um who thankfully hasn't had to set any tests yet um i'm sure it won't be long though um and actually i'm, I'm very very lucky with my children they they all love school um charlie's loving nursery at the moment um alex my yeah. eldest is is, is a bright child, you know, and that, that I say that without any um, sort of firstborn, precious firstborn um, kind of feelings around it. He's genuinely quite bright and is predicted very highly for his GCSEs, which are coming up in not too distant future. But I can remember very clearly his key stage one SATs, where the, the feeling of pressure upon him was so great that he actually developed a nervous tick and he had this tick this sort of physical movement which moved around his body actually over the course of the ensuing 12 months or so after afterwards um it, it was just horrendous um because he he was a bright child he was never going to struggle in those tests he did perfectly fine in them but for a child who'd never really had much pressure put on him, you know, we're not particularly um, massive on doing lots of stuff at home. I think the feeling in his classroom in the build up to those tests um, and the school he attended at the time 
it was everything for that school it the pressure you know I've been through an office I've been teaching for 20 years now and I've been through an office before where honestly those inspectors they didn't even need to bother coming to the school they could have sat in Whitehall looked at our year six results saw that they dipped for that year because I don't know if anyone in government actually realizes this but every year the children who sit the tests are different children. Like, I don't know if anyone considers that. Ooh, this is my child now attacking the computer. Um, they are all different children. And, you know, we're quite lucky at the school I work at at the moment. We don't have massive influxes of, um, you know, uh, new children joining or leaving the school. Unlike some schools where actually, you know, over 50% of your cohort might have changed from key stage one to key stage two SATs. But yeah, my, my eldest really struggled with them. I think the I think the, the emphasis on these tests will change depending on what school you attend. It will change depending on how that senior leadership team feel about what Ofsted are going to say when they come in. And the pressure and the, the awfulness around that will absolutely depend on the ethos at the school that your children attend. And, and in some ways that's gonna be positive for the children there and the staff. Um, but in other ways, the, the pressure can be just unbearable for some head teachers. Um, and then that filters down to the staff and then to the children. And that's the difficulty. It's trying to get the message across to, um, to, to, well to head teachers really to say it's not the be all and end all and unfortunately until we get rid of Ofsted um, we're not going to get that 100% in every school you know when I started my teaching career I was I went into a year two class as an NQT and there was nowhere near the expectation or the pressure that we have on say our year six children now they you know it was you know, it's just going to be a quiz. It's this, it's that. But I remember even then, I, it was a very deprived area in the Northeast. We would get um, the local greengrocers to deliver boxes of bananas every morning. And the children would all have a banana <laughs> before they sat their test, just in case it made a tiny bit of difference. Um, I'm not aware of any school that still does that, but it was quite commonplace at the time that, you know, we absolutely want to make sure all these children have had breakfast, but it was the emphasis on let's make sure they've all had a particular kind of fruit. Um, and I think that's something that continues today. You know, we as educators, we want to make sure our children have got that um, broad spectrum of support around them. And I agree with you. These children need to be fed. They need to um, have somewhere warm and comfortable to sleep at night. They need people who are invested in their education. And I think the big thing about all of this testing is an absolute lack of trust in educators. Now, as a teacher parent, I hand my children over to their schools with the utmost confidence that I know the people in, who work in that building have got the best intentions for my child and the, all the children that they teach, because I know what it's like on the other side of the classroom door. But I don't think the government and certain aspects of the media feel the same about the people who work in our schools and not just the teachers. Everyone in that building wants the absolute best for the children. And whether that's the staff who bring in food in the morning to feed the hungry children, whether it's, and I heard this just recently, the teachers who have sort of a quiet area with cushions and blankets and things for the children who they know don't have a proper bed to sleep in at night so they can have a nap in the corner of the classroom if they need to. That goes hand in hand with trusting us to assess the children. We don't need the government giving us papers that need to be locked away in a filing cabinet somewhere um, to know what those children need. I think it was, it must be six or seven years ago now since I stood up the podium at what was then the NUT National Conference and seconded a motion about boycotting baseline, right? You know, basically get, get rid of baseline assessment and reception and at the time I was a nursery teacher and anyone who's ever worked in a nursery will know you get a very very wide mix of children to come to you um, you need to be able to be calm under pressure when there's a child climbing all over you uh, and trying to throw himself off tables um, you deal with children who've never met their parent before you deal with children who um, have been to nursery since they were six weeks old and everything in between and when I spoke at that conference, it was would have been about Easter time. 
and we were heading towards transition between my nursery class and the school reception class. And I get that not every school has their own nursery, but most children um, will have been somewhere. And most schools will organize visits or conversations between the provision the children have attended before they start reception. And if that's the family home, then that's where we'll go. We go and visit them at home. We did the same as the children came into nursery. I stood at this podium and I talked about a child called Sam, obviously not his real name. Um, Sam was the youngest in our class by a country mile, still eating family meals from, the, from a high chair, hated getting messy, so didn't really want to partake in a lot of the stuff that you provide for children in a nursery. Um, and we had spent months and months and months building up his confidence, getting him to a point where he was, you know, happy and confident and joining in with all with all of the things that we were providing. But as we got closer and closer to him moving into reception, which was literally just through a set of double doors, you know, it wasn't a, a, a big physical transition, if you like. I would be going through to reception to listen to stories with him. He'd suddenly want to sit on my knee again. He didn't want to let go of my hand. Turned out mum was due to have a baby over the summer holidays. So when he returned to school in September to be in that reception class with the most amazing teachers, like our reception staff at school are so wonderful. What on earth would taking him out to the corridor in big school and sitting him down with a test, tell that staff about him. Because it was, it was nothing, literally nothing. Whereas a conversation with me, several conversations with me probably, told them everything they needed to know. They knew before he even walked in the door that first day, he'd need an extra hand to hold. He might need a bit of time on his own. He might then want to talk about all the changes in his house over the summer. No test can give you that. And that's the same whether you're in key stage one, whether you're doing phonics, times tables, anything. You, you ask any educator in any classroom up and down the country, what about that child? What's happening with this child? What does that child need? They can tell you. They don't need a government bit of paper to find it. Like no one looks at their test results and goes, well, that was a total surprise. And I think it's got to come back to trust. As parents, we have to trust that the people in that building are doing the best for our children, despite what you might have read in the media, like we're all sat at home on our sun lounges over the, over the lockdown. Not true. Um, and despite what the government tried to tell us, we need to value educators. We need to put the trust back in them. And I think that's where this change should, should come from, really putting the trust back into the people in the building, because we all want the best for all of those children. I really feel like I should mute now because it's it's not great, is it? <laughs> I feel like I'm actually at work. <laughs> that was great, Amy, and he can make as much noise as he wants. Um, the, the thing that upsets me most about both you and uh, Louise's uh, talks is about this idea of failure, the idea that children have failed when actually the reality is that the education system is failing these children. Um, so I'd like to go to Ian now, because Ian, I know that you've got a question that you would like to, to ask. Well, it depends what you mean by a question, Chair. Comment or contribution. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually feel quite angry listening to the three people that have spoken this morning, and I'm particularly uh, moved, I suppose, by um, what, what Amy's had to say. Uh, I'm a parent, uh, my kids are grown up. Um, I've lived on Teesside all my adult life. For the last 40 years, nearly I've been a governor at schools. And for a large part of that time, I was an elected member of my local authority with responsibility for education. Uh, Red Car and Cleveland, where I live, doesn't have a chief education officer anymore. Um, it used to have, and they used to work with schools and support schools. And um, it's now overtaken by the privatisation of the uh, education service, which is academies, which I'll remind everybody was introduced by a Labour government and the Tories have lifted it to an art form. It's taken our schools away from us. I've always been against parental preference. Uh, I think it was a very bad move, but the genie's out of the bottle now. Kids should go to the local schools. There should be in areas where the local communities are. Um, I, 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 they, they tell me that places like Finland 
I've got a model for education for children. I don't think kids there start school until they're about seven. And then they don't get the range of tests that, do, that we get. Uh, and all the evidence is there. All the three speakers have made these points. The evidence is there. And the goves of this world and the rest of them just ignore all the, all the evidence, check with the Daily Mail whether it's right to do what they want to do, and they get on and do it. And it's all based on their own good instincts. And sad to say, um, I mean, Louise, I think you said you've been a teacher for 30 years. Well, that covers the Blair government as well as the, uh, the current and, and previous Tory government. Uh, and I, I, it was, as I've, as I've just said, they introduced, they introduced academization. But where I live, you know, children, 25 percent of the kids in Red Car and Cleveland are in poverty. And that situation hasn't moved for as long as I've lived in the area. Uh, the first thing the Tories came, did when they came to power in uh, 2011 to 2010 was to scrap the, um, the, the Child Poverty Reduction Act. That was one of the actually the first things they ever did. In Middlesbrough, which is just down the road for me, 40% of children live in poverty. There are 34 languages spoken across the Middlesbrough area, which brings with it its, its own advantage, but also its own, um, its own, its own difficulties. Uh, Middlesbrough, to its very great credit, is a welcoming place for refugees and asylum seekers. And that, that compounds the, the issues they face, certainly in educational terms and across their own society as well. None of these things, as Amy would have said, are taken into consideration at all with all this madness in the testing process. And a note that Jill said that um, we should retain Ofsted. Ofsted. Well, I'm sorry, Jill, I disagree with you totally. I think Amy said she did anyway. Ofsted should be scrapped. It's an enemy of education. It's an enemy of parents. It's an enemy of children, and it's not a sensible way to behave. And I think Amy mentioned trust two or three times. I wrote down while you were speaking, you know, scrap off said, trust teachers. Teachers aren't trusted. And I think there is a bigger picture as well, as far as the Tories are concerned. It's about controlling people. It's make sure we stay in our place and we don't upset the systems that allow them to override our wishes and feelings. And we're not living in a fair society as a consequence. And you can see that from the disgraceful behaviour that's going on in Parliament at this particular moment in time. The way they've got their noses in the troughs, they have, the, they have the parties that the rest of us can't have, and the lying that the Prime Minister spews forth on a daily basis. They're not interested in people that I purport to um, be a part of a community of. They're interested in their own self-interest and making sure that nobody rocks their particular boat. And I'm really disappointed as a Labour Party member, we don't seem to be challenging this. In fact, we seem to be going along with the flow. And that needs to change because we've got to start having a few principles about education. And sadly, they don't seem to be around at the moment. And just very finally, if I may, I think, uh, I, I think Jill, you said in your introduction, I think you said in your introduction that um, a post-pandemic was an expression you used. Post-pandemic? I think we're going into another lockdown, incidentally, and what the scientists say is we're going to have to live with the consequences of pandemics now, COVID or anything else. And what COVID has exposed is the fault lines in British society, not least in education. And where's the mechanisms to deal with them? If we're bringing in new exams, it's as if we never had a pandemic. That's the end of my rant. If you think there's any questions there you need to answer, be my guest. Thank you. All right, Jill, would you like to come back on? Back on that then, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is um, on the Ofsted question, the, the, where I mentioned Ofsted, that was me giving you a summary of a recent uh, report by BIRA, British Educational Research Association, who have put forward a series of recommendations for discussion, which includes mention of Ofsted. More than, of course, not in the role, is certainly not in the position of campaigning one way or another on Ofsted. We just want the system of assessment to be changed. We're not talking about the system of, uh, of uh, school inspections. So we, we certainly don't have a view on that. I was literally just um, mentioning what had been outlined by BIRA in their, in their proposals. So that was that, that was that. Um, I, I would just like to say a point on the political environment. Um, the current Labour Party policy remains to um, change this, change primary assessment, to get rid of SATs and change primary assessment. But um, in the last, since the last election, there has been no public mentions by any member of the Labour front bench about what their position actually is. 
And so I would say to all of you who are clearly all of you active in, in that movement to one in one respect or another, now is the time to make your representations on this into, if you want to have a change of policy on this. There is going to be a significant amount of focus on secondary assessment. And there may even be, um, there may even be a grab by people in power to say that they have made a fundamental change to the education system by reforming GCSEs and secondary assessment. Um, and that may even happen. Some people are suggesting that that might happen before the end of this parliament. Um, can I, there Jill, is, can I ask, can I ask the, you a very quick, sorry. The, 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 if, if we want primary assessment to be involved in that debate, people have to speak out. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Jill, can I ask you a very quick question, please? Of course. Do, do these principles apply to private secondaries? This is, sorry, pri private school primaries. Well, private schools don't don't do SATs. Well, you've answered you've answered the question. Thank you. Louise, please. Sorry, I haven't muted myself. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, just a couple of things, really. I mean. I think you're, I mean, it, what you said, I completely agree with Ian. I mean, the, the academization program has sort of decimated our education system. It's so fragmented, it's very hard um, to, to sort of deal with that. And the Socialist Educational Association has that give us back our schools campaign. So I would suggest that at your next meeting, maybe have somebody from the campaign to come and talk about that. There's a motion for Labour Party um, um, CLPs. Um, and they'll be looking at promoting that through um, other groups as well. So I, I would suggest that you get them get them involved, uh, or us, as I'm from the SEA as well, in, in that as well. Um, uh, poverty is one of the biggest factors, and poverty is increasing in our society, and this government is doing nothing about it at all. In fact, it's making the situation worse when you look at the things that are happening. So... Um, you know, I, I, I volunteer at our local food bank and uh, we are now having, you know, I go after school uh, two evenings a week. I, I've been out this morning before this meeting because the situation is so desperate here. We are also a city of sanctuary, so we've had a big uh, influx of refugees. And again, they arrive with nothing. And, you know, it's only those, prior, it's only those um, you know, voluntary organisations that are in place to support these groups. And you talked about local authorities. They used to be called local education authorities. Uh, people who are older here will remember that. Uh, and uh, they had a really big focus on education. That's that's been completely taken away. All of the, when I first started teaching, there was a huge array of services to schools, fully funded, really good support. All of those services virtually have been removed, decimated, either handed over to uh, the private sector or you know. Um, or just have gone and it's up to schools to sort that themselves. There's no, uh, you, you know, those things haven't been replaced and that's a real problem. Um, and just another thing around um, the post pandemic thing that you raised, because you're right, I think, you know, potentially we are going into another lockdown. Actually for some children and young people, being at home was better for them and they did better at home than they would in school, particularly children with complex STEM needs um, who found it very difficult coming back in after. Um, so, for some children, school has become very difficult for them. Um, and even coming back in uh, in the situation we're in now, I mean, I, I don't know what it's like in other areas. We've got very high case rates here. We're back to some of the lockdown measures with children sat in rows and try and reduce rates. So, you know, it, it, it is very difficult for children at the moment, which is why I think focusing on their emotional health and well-being is a priority for us rather than focusing on tests and assessments. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is this, and, you know, Aim is right. There is no trust uh, in, in education workers. And that, that isn't from the public. That's from governments. Public actually trust education workers very highly. We come high up. The people they don't trust are the politicians who don't trust us, uh, which is why it's really good for us to work with parents, because, uh, that, you know, they are, are some of our biggest advocates. Um, so, you know, arguing around trusting the people that are doing the job. We do the job every day. We did a lot of training. Politicians seem to think because they went to school, they know better than us what to do. But none of them has tra have trained as education workers. Uh, and we do the job every day, day in, day out. We know our children and young people really well. And as Amy says, we assess all the time. 
We don't need a test. We, that's what we do. That's what we're trained to do. We assess, we look at, we learn from, uh, and that is the best way of understanding children and young people is by watching, speaking to them, um, and talk, you know, and, and talking about what is happening for them. Louise, Steve. I it's, it's an observation more than anything else, just if I can be of any use uh, for the campaign. Um, I'm actually standing for Labour this, this year in a ward in Bridget Phillipson's constituency, which is a marginal. Uh, I've got 4,000 leaflets to deliver, which probably aren't going to get done because they've been sitting there since the summer, but that's by the by. Um, and th so at, at some point between now and May, I've got no doubt that I'll be bending a ear on various things. I can't say that her views on education will be the same as mine, but if there's leaflets, pamphlets, I've already spoken with one, uh, one lady on here regarding it. Uh, if you've got anything that's any ammunition that you want passing on or that we, we think we can do physically by talking person to person, and I'm quite happy to do that if it's if it's of any use to the campaign. So just just a heads up, really, that Thank at you, some Steve. point I will be sharing a, 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 a door knock a session with her or two. Thank you. I, I'll I'll just I'll put in the, I'll put my email in the chat, and then you can just send me yours, and we can send some stuff. Send me your address, and we can send some stuff off to you. Great stuff. Cheers. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to make a comment or a contribution? Eileen, is that you unmuting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just say a big thank you to all the speakers, first of all. Um, I wish I just feel so, 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 um, like uh, Ian said, angry and a bit depressed by it all. But, um, but I think probably. The only thing we can do is to is, is like to get organized and see what we can do. I mean, the system is obviously so badly failing on so many levels. We've concentrated a lot on um, primary today. Um, I'm a retired secondary school teacher, but you have exactly, exactly the same problems in secondary schools. It goes all the way through. And I would argue it's also into um, into further education as well. I mean, the, the, this whole system of education has been wrecked in terms of uh, the value it's given. Um, the narrowing of the curriculum in secondaries is shocking. I feel incredibly sorry for anybody uh, working in secondary schools at the moment during the last couple of years with COVID because of the pressure, you know, the pressure in terms of exams. And school students are getting an incredibly raw deal because they are being under permanent um, assessment. Be because we have such a high, we seem to regard the only measurement to be of a, a student success is this final end of year exam. Because of the COVID situation, school students are having to be routinely doing mock assessments. So their whole year is now spent in doing assessments. It's, it's absolute madness in order to provide data. And I would argue that the data is totally meaningless. And like people have already said, uh, teachers know their students and can provide it. And it is about lack of trust. Um, I, how we how we're going to rectify this situation with a Tory government? It's not going to happen, um, and we need to be have a much 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 bolder strategy for education in Labour. If it, we have to challenge what's going on, and I think probably what it really like about more than a score uh, campaign is the involvement with parents we've got to get parents on side and we've got to get parents to understand what's actually going on in schools because i don't think um parents realize what a raw deal their kids are getting um so it's just to share that um, anger at it all and, and yeah, to think about what, what can we do to kind of um, 
make, I would say make, I've now got grandchildren going into the system. So what can we do to improve this system and um, get a better value of education, more rounded, interesting education that we had in school it, that they that they are they deserve. Thank you, Eileen. Um, talking about this moving into to secondary school, I would also then add that, that this has a knock on effect into further education as well. And the number of young people that are coming through who don't have their English and maths, given that the uh, the pressure is on their English and maths attainment, but that, you know, I'm sitting with 17, 18 year olds talking to them about starting sentences with capital letters that need to end with a full stop. Um, and the number also of young people coming through diagnosed with anxiety. Where does that anxiety come from? Because we didn't talk about that 20 years ago. Um, so I don't know whether Jill, you'd like to come back on that or Louise, Amy. Amy. Um I think just on that anxiety level, I would say, imagine being 11 years old, you just finished primary school, you've been with the same kids in the same class since you were four, and you're anxious enough about going into high school. And over that summer, your parents receive a letter telling them that you are not secondary school ready on the basis of your SATS results. How does that make you feel as a child? Because you're bloody well going to secondary school. It's not like you're going to go back and just do another year at primary. You're going. You're probably going in two or three weeks time. You're already feeling sick and stressed about it. And then you get a letter saying, we don't think you're ready. Who, who does that help? Because it sure as hell doesn't help that child who probably felt OK, was a bit nervous, going to be all right. And then you get an official letter saying, that nonsense and it is nonsense ah, so i would suggest ah, it starts if not ah, before certainly with the letter like that landing on your doormat yeah certainly being told that you're wrong and you're failed is going to have a, an impact on your well-being and your mental health louise thank you yeah i mean don't forget they get those letters right through so when they're in year one and they fail their phonics check, they get a letter saying they're a failure. When they're in year four now and they don't get 100% on their, uh, you know, times table test, they're told they're a failure. By the time they get to the end of year six, they've been told they're failure, failures multiple times. And then um, they're told they're not ready for the school that they've got to go to, which is quite an anxious time for them anyway. So I think there's all of that that happens. There's also this very narrow dry curriculum that some children and you know aim is right lots of schools try not to do this you know but there is huge pressure so you know schools can try not to do it but ultimately the pressure to be you know stops you doing some of the things that you might want to do um so you know there's this huge pressure i, I think for a lot of primary children by the time they get to the end of primary school they've had enough of school you know th there's nothing positive about it for them so they go into secondary school not really being excited and full of that joy of education that we would want and certainly I think that is now happening in secondary schools as well you know certainly my daughter by the time she done a GCSE she said I'm not stopping in the education system it's just a negative experience even though she was did very well very high attaining she just said I've had enough of it it's just so negative I don't want to be in it it's just dull um so I think we are turning children off education because we're not creating the joy of learning uh, and that's a, re a really sad state of affairs isn't it and when we know we've got some of the unhappiest children in the world uh that you know, exacerbates that situation. And also we have very high numbers of children living in poverty now. Uh, and again, if you're, if you're worried about whether the lights are gonna, you know, I, I've heard stories of children who haven't known if they've got electricity when they're getting home. So don't know if there'll be lights on that night, don't know if there'll be heat in. We, when we've done um, some surveys of members, we had a child who's he was wearing his trousers to school back to front because he'd got holes in the knees, but parents couldn't afford new ones. And he was embarrassed about going into school with trousers with holes in his knee. We know children are coming into school hungry all the time. Uh, but actually, you know, 
it is good that schools have breakfast clubs, but that's not the answer. The answer is to ensure that everybody in our country, which is a very rich country, has enough money to feed their children, to have a home that they can heat and that they can afford to buy clothes. But we are, our country is spiralling completely the other way, you know, with more and more use of food banks, more and more use um, of, uh, in, in our area, share wear a clothing scheme, lots of children living without the th just the basic things that they need. And then on top of that, we have this toxic school system, which can be very negative. So I, I, I think all of that mix is is very unhelpful and makes uh, you know makes for very unhappy children unfortunately thanks louise you're absolutely right about the compounding factors affecting not just children themselves but the whole family because if you have stressed parents you're going to have stressed children so there's an answer here about housing about people having jobs and about access to education for adults as well so that they can improve their lives too um nicola please you've got your hand up yeah, thank you. And thanks to all the speakers today and uh, particularly my NEU colleagues. It's uh, really good to hear you um, on this subject, um, which is something that's really close to my heart. I'm a primary school teacher and I have come to loathe SATS and what it's doing and the damage that it's doing, um, not least to the curriculum um, of the kids, um, which the, the volume of time that just gets spent on the things that are going to be uh, tested is just becoming ridiculously disproportionate. And it's obviously at the cost of everything else that some of these children could excel at when they're not going to excel ever, despite the amount of time that is put in into the English maths and phonics and times tables rote learning. Um, so we are doing huge numbers of children a massive disservice by continuing this system. Um, I think um, a point was made about um, those of us who are um, have forums in the Labour Party and so on to try and make this issue really clear. And um, I think that's really important. Um, and I think I think people don't understand really. Um, and a lot of parents don't understand exactly what it is the SATs are there for, because they're not there um, as a measure to help gauge where the child's learning has reached um, in order that the next teachers who receive that child can move on in the best way and in the best interests of that child. They are there, those SATs and results are there, the league tables are there simply for schools to be judged and set against each other and of course that has a million knock-on pernicious implications in itself so i think we need to make that really really clear to people that that's what the sats are there for they are there to judge schools and if that's what they're for they're doing a really really bad job of it because you only need to look at the correlation between sats results and the deprivation of the children who are going to those schools which perform least well at SATs to see that there is obviously, um, it's obviously not a clear judge on how well that school is performing. It's a judge of how economically disadvantaged those children are and what kind of toxic environments they come from. Um, and I'm using the word toxic from um, British Medical Journal um, who have written brilliant pieces about the knock-on effects of poverty and family. So I think those are the key points I have in my mind that I would like people to take away with today. Thank you, Nicola. Ian. Thanks, Chair. I, I think this has been one of the best meetings this newly formed SEA has ever had. And we're getting first-hand experience of teachers and parents about what's wrong with the education system. And I think we can all agree, can't we, that there's no more single important service than the one of education. I've got a granddaughter that's a, t a teacher and I'm immensely proud of the fact that uh, she holds that particular position. There's no better job. Uh, and I don't, uh, I, I don't think uh, that, that could be challenged in any way. I'd like to suggest that um, the SEA um, uh, puts, pu puts to the Labour Party because they're, they're the only credible opposition government puts to the Labour Party that we have a special education conference, perhaps sometime in the new year, 
where people like some of the speakers that have been today can appear so we can get the sort of first-hand experiences to some of the politicians in power. Do you know, off the top of my head, I can't even remember who the, uh, the education spokesperson, shadow show spokesperson is for the Labour Party. Does anybody know? I'm sure some of you there will know. But I'd like to suggest that we put it to the Labour Party. There should be a special education conference to determine once and for all where we think it should be going in terms of an alternative that the Tories have thrusting down our throats along with their uh, their uh, their allies in in, in the media um, and just that really because it's the most important thing we face for for our for, for our children and for our society and, and see what response we get i guess uh, is it james white in our general secretary i forget his name as well um, yeah. if people are agreeable perhaps we could with help and support, get him to put some sort of a proposal forward to the shadow spokesperson, if not the leader. Because I'm sure they appreciate that education is important. It's just a question of where we take it. So if I need to formally move that in any way, Chair, I'll do that. Thank Thanks, you. Ian. I've already invited Bridget Phillipson to our next meeting. She can't make that date, so I, I've got back to her office and asked to try and find an alternative date. Um, I think it's really important that given that she's in our northern region, that she comes and, and talks to us as the Socialist Education Association. Um, so I'll update you if, if we do get a date fixed for that. Thank you. Louise. Uh, Kate Green is the Shadow Education Secretary. Um, but um, uh, when I had a discussion with her about uh, a number of things to do with education, one of, the, one of her key things is that you shouldn't mess with they don't they're not interested in messing with the structures at the moment so they're not what they're saying is that they that they're quite happy with the academization to stay as it is really and we, we disagree with her on that because we think if you don't change the structures you're never going to change the system actually but anyway um and uh, uh, and certainly we would want them to be calling for the scrapping of Ofsted and to uphold their policy on um primary testing which at the moment as Jilla said they say nothing about at all really I, um, I, I'm quite happy to take that proposal, Ian, to, uh, to the SEA. I'm quite happy to email after the meeting and say I've been here and that that is, it is a proposal um, and that we ask to launch a sort of major conference. I mean, we could link that into a, to our Give Us Back Our Schools campaign um, as the SEA because that sort of focuses on all of these structural things and the assessments. So um, I, I'm quite happy to to say I've been here today and that that has come forward as a proposal. Thank you, Jill. I just really wanted to, to um, agree with e what Ian said. I feel like this is a very, very soft policy issue. All of us who are working on this campaign are kind of at a loss to understand where the, where the, the Labour front bench team are coming from because there's, it, it's not going to lose them any votes. <laughs> if anyone who has had a child who has gone through the state education system in the last 15 years is going to agree with this. And um, that's so I think that there's the the biggest opportunity you've got as members of that movement is to push for that policy from within. And so I would just really encourage you all to do that. That was all I really wanted to say. I know that Paul wants to say something. I just noticed in the chat, so I don't want him to lose out. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks, yeah, I can't stick my hand up because I'm the host. Um, so what I was going to say is um, throughout the, like, the pandemic, I think we've missed so many opportunities. I do think the general public realise how stupid testing is how pointless it is um, and we saw I know this was mainly related to uh, primary school testing but we saw what happened during the GCSEs and during the A-levels when they decided it was just going to be postcode an algorithm that decided what your grades were I think um, you know for the first time in a long time to the entire public that the ludicrous nature of our testing system was exposed and I'm furious that nobody took that and ran with it and said right now it's time for an overhaul and I think that if anyone's going to do it that really should be um that should be us it should be the Labour Party doing that as well 
but the Labour Party appear to want to go back to the status quo and, oh, let's get tests back up and running, that kind of thing. I do think the public will be on our side if, um, if we push for a complete overhaul of the testing system. It has been exposed as nonsensical. And, um, and you know, I think that's got to be a, a massive focus for us. So I guess the, the question would be, how do we go about that? How do we go about making sure that we, um, we get the public on side? Because I think they're ready for that. And how do we make sure that these campaigns are really, really visible and listened to? Because we know the media aren't going to do this and mainstream political parties don't seem particularly interested in this at the moment either. Amy, please, and then I'll go to Joanna after Amy, thank you. Yeah, hi, I just want to say that I agree that we need to be taking this to the Labour Party. It's absolutely, it should be people like us who are shaping what their policy is going to be. But I would add to that, two of the biggest losses we've suffered, or the children have suffered to their education system is actually the Sure Start Centres and the, the EMA, the uh, Education Maintenance Allowance, which was for children, uh, uh, an amount of money for children to encourage them to stay in education so children who are getting to the other end of their GCSEs giving them a certain amount of money each week so they could afford their bus fare to go to college or a jacket because they have to wear business dress not school uniform and that the, my sister works in a, a in a large secondary in the northeast that that six forms actually now gone because their numbers dropped I'm not saying you know, those two things are the exact reason why. But my God, it's got to have had such an impact. If you work in one of the most deprived areas um, of your local area, of your region, and your children can no longer afford to get the bus to your provision because they cut EMA, but you've got children who, I mean, the speech and language difficulties we get into our early years units, because the sheer starts have gone. You know, we've got, the, 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 there's, there's more to this as well that, we can campaign on. Thanks, Amy. Joanna, please. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I'd just like to echo what I think Ian said, uh, that this has been an, uh, a really excellent, useful meeting. Uh, all, <laughs> quite a horrifying meeting in many ways, uh, because this whole, this whole testing system is so absolutely awful but you between you you've made it so clear uh, how bad it is uh, and how it's doing nothing to help youngsters at all uh, I think I think the idea of pushing for a national uh, conference uh, uh, would be really good and I hope we can do that uh, and I hope Hope very much that we can get Bridget Philipson to come and speak to us uh, as a branch. That would be really good. Uh, and uh, or part your elbow, Anya, in <laughs> in pushing on her. Please stress to her, you know, that as a branch, you know, we've had a meeting, we've discussed it, we are wanting to talk with her. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, it's not just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, invitation. She was agreeable, Joanna. Oh, well, the, the, that's the, mes the message that came back was that she was agreeable and she would like to do that. No, uh, that's so which I'm trying to arrange a date with her office. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the the one point which hasn't really come up, uh, and but I think is kind of related to this whole. I mean, the whole thing is about control, isn't it? It's all about the government controlling us, uh, controlling schools and everything. And I would link to that the discussion which is going on at the moment about initial teacher training, where the way I read it is that they are really gunning, gunning to get teacher training out of the university sector uh, so that they can control it. And more importantly, and more awfully, uh, they want to deep that it is to deprofessionalize the teaching profession uh, and you know I, I'm old enough to remember when it was all uh, things were actually uh, improving uh, and teacher education was a university subject and uh, uh, you know the teacher training college 
these were made part of universities and polys. Uh, and they, so it, that was on the up. But this, I think, is a very negative, I think this current trend is very negative. Uh, and I think we should link it to this whole set of controls that they're in, introducing, if we can. Thank you, Louise. Did you want to come back on that? Just brief, I mean, I won't, I mean, uh, initial teacher training is a huge topic. I mean, I, I agree with everything Joanna said, but I, I mean, I, I don't think we should start a discussion about that now, because I'm sure myself, Amy and Jill would have a lot uh, to say about that and others. But just a couple of things, really. Paul said, what can we do? I mean, <clears throat> prior to COVID and us not being out and about doing things, we used to have regular more than a school stores and children are too young to test, all those sorts of things. and. You know, it is that raising awareness in our communities, talking to people, um, and as soon as we can get back out on the streets, we'll be doing some of that. I think the idea of a, a big conference on education is very good. Um, but also, I think, and I say this at any event I go to, really, what, whatever it's about, you know, there are all of us in our, this room, if we all go and talk to a few other people, and each of those people goes and talks to a few other people about what we've learned, we're passing a message on. We have to keep talking about this and also things like sharing the more than a school petition making sure you're putting that on all your social media uh, certainly the union we send out stuff and we'll be sending you know out any links again um, so it is that sort of sharing thing and I just want to say one last thing really because it, it this subject can be very you know I can see that people are like oh, this is awful but what I have to say to you is, I, I love my job. I love the job I do every day. I wouldn't do any other job. I try very hard to mitigate for the young people in my class against anything um, that is harmful. We have to do certain things and that's what we all have to do. Amy will be in the same position. We all have to do certain things because that's what the government imposes on us. But I have a joyful classroom and I make sure that my children feel cared for and go home feeling as positive about what they do every day. And there's lots and lots of education workers out there doing that. So although we've had a bit of a, I don't want people to go away thinking, you know, there's nobody out there enjoying it. You know, lots of us love what we do. We work hard to try and mitigate against the awful situation that we find ourselves in. But together, we have to fight to make it a different system so that new education workers coming in don't have to fight against such an oppressive system. Thank you, Louise. So those were wonderful closing comments. Thank you. So I would like to, to bring this part of our meeting to a close now. Um, and so, Paul, if you would stop recording, please. And I would like to thank you, all of you, for giving up your time this weekend. Thank you so much to Jill, to Louise and to Amy. Thank you.